Welcome to this edition of Housing Fair, Safe and Affordable. Uh, my name is Jonathan Bond. I'm the director of Vermont Tenants and the Mobile Home Program at the Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity. In the past, we've had shows that have covered various topics from fair housing uh, to the connections of housing and credit, as well as different types of affordable housing options that are available. Today, we're gonna skip that step and, and talk briefly about rights and responsibilities that renters have in Vermont. And we're going to call uh, today's segment Tips for Tenants. So while we're going to talk about several uh, different topics today, if you have specific questions about your rental concerns, I would encourage you to call our message line at 802-864-0099. We'll usually be able to return a call within 24 to 48 hours. And you can ask the sort of questions that may not be answered here today. What we're going to be going over today are the basics, and hopefully we'll provide an opportunity for a light bulb moment of what your tenant rights are. So it's hard for us to talk about your rights and responsibilities as a tenant without acknowledging that we have a, a very tight rental market. Statewide, our rental vacancies are only about 1%, meaning for every 100 homes, there's only one rental that may be available. In Burlington, those numbers are a little bit better, with a few more rentals being available. But generally, it's a very tight market and provides very little choice. Along those lines, there's also, we have also a lot of older housing in Vermont. And so the types of quality of the rental units sometimes are older and need more, uh, more attention uh, as a renter. As we move on to our rights and responsibilities as tenants, it's important to know that this is what, what is outlined in Vermont's laws. Renters have a specific set of rights and they have a specific set of responsibilities. And together, they hopefully will help you navigate the very complicated waters of, rent, of renting in Vermont. Let's start first with our rights. So a tenant has a right to safe and decent housing, and this includes the right to reporting substandard housing um, should the conditions be less than ideal. We have the right as tenants to 48 hours notice before our landlord enters our unit. And they're only allowed to enter our unit with that notice between the hours of 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. There are exceptions if there are emergencies or if we're inviting our landlord in to address an issue, but generally it's a 48 hour notice. While we don't have the right to negotiate our rent in most situations, we do have the right to proper uh, notice if rent is going to increase, generally about 60 days. We also have the right for proper notice if our landlord is deciding to move away from our tenancy to terminate it. And if it should come to an eviction, we have the right to contest it in the court. And finally, we have the right to a refundable security deposit, and we're going to get to more details about that later. In conjunction with our rights, we have several responsibilities that we as tenants need to be meeting. The first is probably the most obvious. It's paying our rent on time. There is no grace period in Vermont law for paying rent. It's important when we rent a new unit to know when rent is due and what the process of paying rent to our new landlord is going to be. It's our responsibility to keep our apartment safe and clean and up to code. And generally what that means is we're not piling things in front of the doorways or windows, we're not making unsafe situations regarding fire safety, and we're keeping it generally clean, including bathrooms and kitchens. If there are problems, and problems always crop up in every rental, it's important that we immediately notify our landlord of any issues. And we're responsible for our guest's behavior, and that's really important. Any rental unit, the buck stops with the tenant regarding who's coming over. So whether it's friends or family, it's knowing that we're responsible for our guests should something happen. It's our responsibility to act in a respectful manner that doesn't disturb our neighbors. And it's our neighbor's responsibility to also work with us in that way. We need to make sure we deal appropriately with the trash and recycling. And oftentimes that just means knowing how at that particular unit to do so, whether trash is picked up weekly or whether there's a dumpster on the premise and how recycling is sorted in the community that you're living in. When it comes time for us to move on, we have the responsibility to give proper notice. And we'll go over that in a little bit, what proper notice is. But essentially, it's advance warning to our landlord that we're moving on, whether it's to a new apartment due to a change of job or other life circumstance, or perhaps we're buying our own home and moving out of the rental market completely. And then the final responsibility we have as tenants is to follow the terms of our lease. 
And this is just a reminder that any lease agreement that we sign, it's very important for us to make sure we understand it completely because it's a contract between a tenant and the landlord as to how renting is going to be, how the rent of that unit is going to be conducted. As we move on to all of these specific rules and rights, we want to make sure we have some just basic tips for us to remember. The first is know your rights and keep it professional. Uh, we want to make sure that we as tenants are working with our landlords, but we want to do this through the enforcement of our rights. We want to keep everything important in writing, and this is critical. In a digital age, it's so easy for us to send an email or send a text, but a lot of our renting law requires us to make sure we write a letter to our landlord in, very, in most situations. And then finally, there are some other resources that are out there, and it's important to know what resources are available in your community when you rent a new apartment. Starting with renting starts with a lease agreement. After we've found an apartment that we might be able to afford, and we're able to contact the landlord for a showing. If everything goes well, we're going to be offered a lease agreement that's going to define the terms of who's renting the apartment, where the apartment is located, making sure that the apartment that we're shown is also the same address as the apartment that's being rented on our lease. It defines the terms of when uh, the, the apartment is being rented, whether it's for a year, for an initial lease, whether the lease is starting to a month-to-month -month term, or that there's some other term or agreement that's being, being proposed for the timeline. And then finally, it's going to go over the, accept, the exceptions on, the expectations on how we're renting. So how are we paying rent? How is trash and recycling being dealt with? Where is there parking on the premise? Uh, what are the shared and open spaces used by other tenants? And what are the spaces or the dwelling that we're renting at the exclusion of all others. And those are going to be in the lease agreement. It's important to know that in Vermont, a lease can be written or it can be verbal. Although we encourage everyone to have a written lease when they rent, it is important to know that if you enter into a rental agreement and you do not pay, uh, you do not sign anything but are paying rent, you have tenant rights and you have things that are protecting you. And if you have questions, you should feel free to call our hotline at 802-864 0099 regarding your specific rights under a verbal lease. The next thing that we're going to go over are deposits. So generally considered de security deposits, a deposit is anything that's paid up front before you've started renting the unit. These deposits are never non-refundable. Generally in most circumstances, fees are prohibited in Vermont tenant law but a landlord is allowed to ask for a reasonable deposit as part of that. It's a means to protect the landlord for excessive wear and tear that may occur during the unit, essentially damages that may be occurring, whether it's a hole in the wall or if we don't report damage that causes further damage, such as a leaky faucet that turns into a rotting sink. Uh, these are the types of extra damages that we would be looking at that would be coming out of a deposit. Um, however, if a unit is returned to the landlord in the same condition it was received in, we should be expecting to get 100% of our security deposit back. And we'll go over some of the tips on how to get those back in just a moment. One final thing is, is that deposits, while they're meant to protect against excessive wear and tear, they are not meant to protect against normal wear and tear. And a classic example is a carpet, a carpeted room. If there's old carpet in a building that's been there for 10 or 15 years, it simply may be wearing out over tenants over the years. And it's not the responsibility of the last tenant to be able to replace that when the time comes. In that sense, it's normal wear and tear. And the landlord is going to replace that carpet as part of their normal business practice and maintaining their unit and shouldn't be coming out of your security deposit. Another way of looking at it, however, would be if the carpet was just replaced upon before renting the apartment, and then if there was damage a year later, it may be excessive wear and tear to that particular carpeted entryway or room, and that might come out of your security deposit. So there are going to be variations depending on the damage and the expected life expectancy of the various things in the apartment. But how do we protect ourselves? And that's really the key here. The first is looking to take as many pictures as possible before you move in. It's very tempting when you're moving into an apartment to kind of hold off on, on taking the photos and just move all of your stuff in. 
However, it's exceptionally important before you move your things in to get a look of the uh, condition of the apartment beforehand. Take as many pictures as possible. The next strategy is walking through the apartment with your landlord. A responsible landlord is going to ask you for a walkthrough right from the beginning. But if a landlord for whatever reason forgets, it's a great opportunity for a tenant to show that they are responsible and that they do care about the unit by asking to do a walkthrough. This walkthrough should go through a basic checklist of any things that need to be repaired or conditions of various surfaces, sinks, anywhere where there's water is important to be monitoring. Um, any large holes in the wall or dents that might need to be fixed, making sure all of the window sills uh, are free from rot and paint flakes, making sure all of the windows and doors open properly, and checking all of the locks. Making sure that the room that we're being rented has a way to get out of in the case of an emergency, because all bedrooms are required to have at least two egresses, meaning whether it's a main door and a large window or two doors, essentially two ways to get out of the room in the emergency. And this is your opportunity to double check that when you're renting the unit that you're, and the, checking the bedroom you're going to call home. Making a list of all these damages are important. And then finally, having a signed copy of this list that's signed and dated by both you and your landlord and making sure you both get a copy of it. If you're the one doing the walkthrough, I would encourage you to make sure you make a copy of it immediately and get it to your landlord as quickly as possible. If your landlord is the one holding on to the document, as just a final check to make sure it doesn't get lost, make sure you take a picture of it because that picture will serve as your proof that you did a walkthrough and the various conditions of the apartment before you moved in. Anything that was broken before you moved in is not your responsibility and shouldn't come out of your rent or security deposit after the fact. When the time comes to move out, we're going to look to do everything in, in reverse. We're going to do a walkthrough with the landlord after we've moved all of our stuff out. And just like as we're eager to move all of our stuff into the unit, after we get that last box in the moving truck, instead of rushing over to our new apartment or our new home, it's important to take a pause and to do the walkthrough with your landlord. You're also going to want to review and take pictures of the unit in the same way you did when you moved in. This is incredibly important because you now will have before and after photos of the apartment that you're renting and you should be able to get most of your security deposit back if there are a few damages, or be able to show that there are no damages as a result of your tenancy that were unaddressed at the time that you moved out. If for whatever reason someone causes damages when they move in, such as the next tenant, you're not going to be the one responsible and you'll have the evidence to support this. Generally, you should be getting your security deposit back or an itemized letter with the detailed reasons as to why you're not getting a portion or all of your security deposit back within 14 days. It's important that you give your landlord your, last, your best forwarding address because your landlord is required to send it to your last known address. And you want to make sure your last known address is your new apartment and not the apartment you were previously renting. If you're living in Burlington and you would like to dispute your security deposit, there is a housing board of review that will allow these disputes in a timely fashion within 30 to 45 days after that. Outside of the Burlington area, if there are further disputes, they are usually governed in small claims court, and we would encourage you to contact legal assistance for more information about that. The next thing we're going to talk about are renters with with disabilities and the some protections that we have with various ailments and disabilities that we're dealing with. Generally in every apartment there's going to be quirks to the apartment and some of the times that might interfere with a physical uh, or other medical condition that we may be experiencing. In the case where there are physical changes that need to be made to the apartment we call those reasonable modifications. A great example of a reasonable modification is that for whatever reason you have a medical condition that may make it uh, um, difficult to go in and out of the tub without worrying about slipping. And so the simple fix would be have proper installation of grab bars as well as anti-slip surfaces so you can be more confident when you're getting in and out of the tub. Now while it's really tempting to try to install these on our own, we want to make sure that the installation of any of these modifications first goes through a process of notifying the landlord of the symptom that you're trying, to, you're trying to address, as well as the fact that it's going to be installed professionally. 
If you're not someone who's used to installing these things, you're going to want to find a professional to do so. In the case of anti-slip surfaces, they may be as simple as stickies at the bottom of a tub, but for the grab bar, it may be something that needs to be installed properly. It's important to note that for private landlords, it's the responsibility to pay for these modifications uh, is on the tenant. If you're in subsidized housing, there may be a responsibility by the uh, nonprofit owner of the building to make these modifications true. So you're just going to want to check with your landlord and they'll know which of those they need to address. It is important to note that there are such things as reasonable modifications. So if I need for whatever reason a, a large ramp on the third uh, floor apartment or an elevator, that might actually be seen as an unreasonable modification and I may need to be looking for other types of housing that can accommodate that. But generally, if I lived on the first floor, a ramp in and out of a few steps would be considered reasonable and an easier ask for us to make. The next type of special situation when it comes to a renter who has any sort of disability is what we call a reasonable accommodation. And just like reasonable modifications addressed physical disabilities, reasonable accommodations address rules, policies, or practices of the apartment that might interfere with a condition or a symptom of that condition that we have. A classic example is that some of us are assigned medical assistance animals as part of our day-to-day -day lives to treat a condition that we may have, but we may live in an apartment that has a no-pet policy. Generally speaking, it's important to get a note from someone who's familiar with your condition and familiar with the animal that treats that condition or symptom and be able to provide that to the landlord to be able to overcome this obstacle. Another example would be an apartment that has parking spaces but may not have assigned parking spaces. If for whatever reason there was a medical condition that made it hard to walk from our apartment to our car, but we were otherwise okay in our apartment or in our car, we might ask for an assigned parking space a little bit closer. And that's acceptable under a reasonable accommodation, assuming that parking is part of your apartment um, that's available to you. Moving on, we're going to be looking at repairs. And every apartment at some point is going to need a repair. Whether it's a minor repair, such as a loose, ca uh, a loose cabinet, or a more moderate repair, such as a leaky faucet. It's important to know what steps we could take um, and our responsibilities as tenants as well. Any issues that you have in your apartment need to be promptly reported to your landlord. And just as we noted that most of this requires in writing, this requires writing our landlord a letter and dating that letter saying that there is a specific issue that needs to be addressed in the apartment. Any damage or repair that needs to be made in an apartment is the responsibility of the landlords to make, even if the repairs are being made as a result of damage that's at the fault of the tenant. A tenant may be responsible for paying for damage that they caused, but generally the repair should still be made by the landlord. It's important to also note that we want to make sure that we're telling our landlord promptly about any issues that we have in the apartment because reporting damage in and of itself isn't a negative activity. However, if we don't report that damage and it becomes a larger problem through our tenancy, we can be responsible for all of the damage that was caused because we didn't report it. A classic example is a leaky faucet. Faucets are going to leak and there's very little that we can do about it. However, if we don't report that problem and the leak in the faucet gets worse, it's likely that water is going to rot out the back of the faucet base or perhaps even encourage the growth of mold. And now the problem has become a simple fix to the faucet to a much larger issue to the actual structural integrity in the bathroom or a kitchen. And we might be responsible for that if we don't report it. So it's important to put in writing any issue to the landlord as small as a leaky faucet. So if it does become a larger issue later on, we're not responsible for that. We've already made that report. Now, if you have an issue that you're not sure if you need to tell your landlord, it's a great opportunity to call Vermont tenants. We're going to walk you through that. Again, the number for our, our message line is 802-864-0099. It will take the guesswork out of when you need to write that letter, and we also have pre-formatted letters that we can direct to you either via email or on our website that will help you through the process of writing the correct, correctly worded letter to your landlord. Now, under the law, there are certain caveats 
um, regarding what they call repair and deduct. And today we're not going to go over that in much detail. Generally, it's important to make sure that you promptly report anything to your landlord, and there's a waiting period of at least 30 days, if not more, before we attempt to make any repair ourselves. We want to give our landlord the chance to be able to make that repair. But if you have questions about a repair that's been reported to your landlord and is not being taken seriously, or for whatever reason the landlord is unable to get to it in a timely manner, give us a call as we have some tips to help you through that process. Now, when we talk about repairs, we're usually talking about minor issues, whether it's a dent in the wall, a scrape in the paint, a small leaky faucet, or something minor like that. However, there are major repairs that need to be made sometimes, and those are under rental safety code. And so we're going to put up a, a brief list of what these issues might be. So for instance, if your water isn't running at all, or you don't have any hot water, if you don't have any wa uh, working toilets, if there's no heat, any leaks in the roof, windows that don't open or are broken, windows that can't be escaped through during a fire, no smoke alarms, any standing water, or the visible or obvious presence of mold. These would constitute safety issues that would impact the safety of you and everyone living in that unit. And these are a bit more serious. It's important that you tell your landlord right away. And while you still need to make sure that you put all of these issues in writing, it's your opportunity to call your landlord right away and let them know about the issue. A responsible landlord is going to respond immediately to items like no heat or no running water. And it's important that you know that if your landlord doesn't respond promptly, that you have some rights to be able to report this to your local code enforcement or town health officer to make sure that these issues are promptly addressed. In those cases where it's not promptly addressed and a town health officer or code enforcement officer does an inspection, they're going to inspect the issue at hand and make sure that there are no other rental safety violations in the home. If there are, they're going to give the landlord a reasonable amount of time to make those repairs. In the case of having no heat or no running water, that might be till the end of the day or to come up with some alternative emergency fix in the meantime. In the issue such as a broken window, they might give the landlord more time to be able to replace that window, specifically in the winter time where it's a bit more difficult to do so. If you have questions about whether it's a minor or major repair, before you call anyone, I would encourage you to simply call Vermont Tenants at 802-864-0099. We're going to be help you to dissect the issue, whether it's a major or minor repair, and get you on the right path to getting that corrected. Now we talked a little bit about our rights and responsibilities as notice periods. Both our landlord giving us proper notice if they're going to stop renting to us at the end of a rental agreement, or our responsibility as tenants to give our landlord proper notice that we're moving out so they can rent the unit to someone else. We're gonna start first with landlord notice periods. The landlord notice period is the amount of time a landlord must provide you before you leave your apartment. Generally, it's about 30 days. Uh, but it can be longer or shorter depending on the issue. Uh, for instance, if you live in the towns of Bur cities of Burlington or Barrie, there may be a longer period of time, and if you have questions about that, you should just give us a call. And we also have information on our website at cvoeo.org backslash tenants. Generally, though, you can assume about 30 days as your general notice period. For rent increases, it's actually 60 days, so you have a little bit more time if you're going to be able to continue to rent the unit, but your rent is going to be increasing at some point in the future. Notice periods, though, can be changed as part of the lease agreement in some situations. So it's really important that you read your lease agreement carefully and understand the notice periods, as well as communicating with your landlord. Oftentimes, notice periods just mean clear communication in writing to and from your landlord. Now, while your landlord's notice periods under the law are measured in the number of days that they have to provide in advance, the notice periods for tenants are a little bit different, and we're going to show a little bit of a graphic to help demonstrate that. So the tenant notice period is in the number of rental periods. So whereas a landlord has 30 days, we have a number of rental periods, and we're going to assume a rental period of the month of December. So if in, on November 15th, I determine that I'm going to need to move out of my apartment, 
I'm responsible and I'm at the end of my lease agreement or I'm in a month-to-month -month lease agreement. It is important that this doesn't include being in the middle of your term. That would be breaking your lease. Uh, this is for when you're at the end of a lease agreement or in a month-to-month -month lease agreement, giving a proper notice. But getting back to the visual, if on November 15th I'm moving out of my apartment, I need to give the entire month of December for my notice period. And that is going to be the notice period in which I'm still responsible to pay the rent, make sure the apartment is maintained by myself before someone else can move in. And then in January, I'm able to move on. Just like in Burlington, giving landlords more time, uh, giving landlords a requirement to give us more time, uh, it's important to know that we as tenants have to give more time. So in the rest of the state, we have one rental period notice, but in Burlington and Barrie, we need to provide two rental periods notice. So given the same example, if I'm moving, deciding I'm moving out in the middle of November, I have to give the entire month of December and January as my rental periods. If we break the lease or we don't give proper notice at the end of that period, we can be responsible for the months that were accumulated during the period that we didn't report, as well as the cost of advertising the apartment. Because we have such a tight rental market, there's no need for a, re a renter to have to pay those costs. So just make sure when it comes time to move out of your apartment that you know what your rental periods are and that you give the proper notice of that. The final topic we're just going to really brush over is termination versus eviction. And these terms sometimes get used a little bit interchangeably. The termination of tenancy simply means that a landlord is asking you to leave. And sometimes the letters for termination of tenancy are strongly worded. But generally speaking, tenants can be terminated because you're at the end of a lease agreement and you're not signing a new agreement with that landlord. You're going to get a letter for termination of tenancy. In many situations, or all situations, this same letter will happen if for whatever reason we don't meet our responsibility and pay our rent, we also may get a letter for termination of tenancy. In that case, it will then turn into an eviction. But it's important to note that it's not the landlord evicting the tenant. Ultimately, an eviction still has to go through a fairly lengthy court process that will allow the tenant and the landlord to air their case for why they're trying to force the contract being broken between the tenant and the landlord. If we're generally paying our rent and maintaining our unit, we may get a termination of tenancy, but we'll likely avoid eviction notices. If you receive a termination notice that you weren't expecting, or you receive any court documentation that says it's, that you may be at risk for being evicted and that, your course, uh, that the case has been started, it's extremely important that you don't call Vermont tenants, but actually obtain legal resources such as a lawyer. While we can give a lot of advice to help you navigate the complex waters of tenancy, when it comes to an eviction, you need someone who's going to be able to help you through the court process and stand before you for a judge. If you don't know where to start, feel free to call us and we can help point you in the right direction with the various legal resources that are out there. So we're going to close today with a quick recap of what we, what we were trying to accomplish. The real basics for tips for tenants is knowing our rights and keeping it professional. This is the number one thing that we can recommend. The next, just as we've said a few times, is keep everything in writing. And if you're unsure, sending a letter is the best way. When you send a letter, it's important that your name, the issue, your signature, as well as the date that you're sending the letter are on the letter. It's important for you to also keep a copy of any letters that are mailed. And if you need extra proof that your landlord is receiving your letters, you can cert send it certified mail to add a little bit of extra security to the process. And then finally, know what resources are out there. Renting doesn't have to be a guessing game. It's something you can be sure of. You can call us at Vermont Tenants, or you can ask to learn a little bit more about this. So while we've gone through a really brief segment of what your renters rights, we have full education packages that are available. And so we're gonna put two numbers up on the board to go over that. If you're interested in taking a class to learn more about your tenant skills and you live in the Chittenden County area, you can give us a call at 802 660 3455 extension 205. This is our hotline for our class coordinator, and we'll be able to register you for an upcoming class um, going over what we did today, such as tenant skills, or recommending other classes that we have available throughout the year that help with renting.